My name is Stephen Fee. Uh, I'm currently the Vice President of Communications at Enterprise Community Partners. I'm based in New York City. Uh, in addition to the lovely introduction, I used to work at CEU um, on the Budapest campus. So uh, it's nice to see so many of you. Um, I feel deeply about the mission of CEU, the, the work of OSUN uh, internationally. And so I'm really happy to be here. I'm very excited. So I am going to ask one favor from the OSUN team. If you all could just give me uh, some indications on time. I think we have at least an hour, but if you all can give me a, a signal when we're getting close to time so that I don't blow through it all here. We gotcha. Great. Okay. That's fantastic. So I am going to try my hardest to share my screen uh, and hopefully you all are able to see that slide deck. Can I get a couple of thumbs up of everyone? I see a few. Okay, good. It's full screen, right? It's not all the stuff on the side and the margins. Great. Okay. Well, you know, as I said, you know, I, uh, I did work at CEU from 2010 to 2012. So it's, it's nice to be back. Um, and I'm here today, not to talk about that, but to present to you all about communications and specifically communicating for impact. Um, you know, uh, I, uh, my experience is mostly based in North America, um, but I really tried to design this presentation with a more global audience in mind. Uh, and again, I don't need to hear myself talk. I talk a lot. I talk very fast. So if anyone needs me to slow down, please say so. I will do my best. But I really do want to hear from all of you. So I've got, you know, a slide deck and all my notes. Um, but please interrupt me. Um, raise your hand. Get into the chat. I think the team here will notify me if there's questions coming through. But I really want this to be open. There's a great group of folks here, and I want to make sure you're all um, having a chance to be part of this conversation. Um, so without further ado, let's dive right in. So, you know, first, I think we should just start with some definitions. It's where I like to start. You know, what are we talking about when we talk about public communications? I tend to use a fairly loose definition, but basically I'm thinking about all of the ways that an individual or an organization presents itself to specific audiences. That's your blogs, your social channels, your, your PR work, your speaking engagements, your visual identity, how you tell your story through visuals, um, your brand, who you are, uh, and your publications. Um, and I know not all of you are experts in this field. Some of you might be. I uh, would love to hear from some of you if you are communications leaders, you have experience with it. Um, but I want to, you know, talk to you all as, you know, future and current leaders who need to really understand how public communications plays a role in making um, big change. So, you know, a caveat, I'll say that I talk about public communications is about uh, reaching a wider public, not necessarily expert facing, as you'll see there at the bottom. Um, but, you know, I think the most important thing is that the work of public communications to me really revolves around these three core principles that you see here on the screen. So the first, and again, these might be very self-evident, uh, but the first is audience. This is who are we trying to reach? And I think the number one mistake leaders across fields make um, is saying that they're trying to reach everyone. Um, trust me when I tell you this is not a winning strategy. Even the biggest global brands, right? You know, your Coca-Cola, your Apple, your Ford, they may try to market to a maximal audience, but they're thinking about certain demographics, people who live in certain regions, believe certain things, vote a certain way. And it's the same thing when you're working in advocacy, human rights, and public policy. You need to define your audience. Uh, the second plank is strategy, right? How are we going to reach that audience? And what tactics are we going to use? Um, and we'll talk in this presentation, you know, especially for smaller or mid-sized organizations or uh, businesses, you know, you're in heated competition. Marketing your message and connecting with the right audiences is really key to your work. And then the third component, the third principle is goal setting. Again, maybe this is very obvious for everyone here, but like all good work, we're trying to figure out what are we trying to achieve and how will we know what success looks like? 
Um, you know, not all public communications campaigns are quantifiable, um, especially in the work that I do in advocacy and change making. You know, our public communications isn't selling products. So sometimes we can't necessarily measure every single piece of the work that we do. Um, but there's still proxies for success. Um, you know, measurements on digital platforms in particular, and the tools for that measurement are becoming increasingly accessible and increasingly affordable. There's no excuse, I think, when you're planning for public communications for not coming up with some key metrics and benchmarks. So those are my big principles here. Um, and I see, okay, Grayson Morley, uh, you're in communications at Bard, fantastic. Here in, in New York State or globally? New York State, yep. Great. Okay. We're neighbors down the street. Fantastic. <laughs> well, you'll correct me when I get all this stuff wrong, right, Grayson? I expect No, it. I will not. <laughs> you can interrupt. It's good. It's good. Great. So, oh, sorry. That's not the right slide. Stand by for just a second here. <laughs> it's always a technical difficulty. So, you know, nothing that I'm saying here is particularly new or novel. Um, you know, again, like Grayson or others of you in the business, um, you probably already live by a lot of these principles. The, the, the challenge that I think leaders face, both in communications and outside of communications, is that the landscape just keeps shifting. Um, digital platforms evolve. Algorithms change. I'm sure many of you, if you're in the marketing sector, you know, a few years ago, a lot of brands did the pivot to video. Uh, everyone was making video content for platforms like Facebook. And then suddenly the Facebook's algorithms changed and strategies changed and the floor came out from under digital marketers. And so that's very hard, especially for those who are non-specialists where communications is part of your job, but it's not your whole job. There's a lot that's changing in the field that you have to keep track of, and that's a big challenge. So I want to highlight where I think some of those big challenges are, but also how you're going to tackle them. I think that's really important. And I'm just checking in the, oh, and I, someone else from Bard comms at Bard College in Berlin, the Bard crew here really showing up. I love it. Um, and a communications expert and trainer. See, I don't know, Victoria, again, you're going to have to interrupt me here too when I get stuff wrong, or please add um, as you see. Great, so here's where I think things have really changed. I think the first piece of this is that audiences aren't coming to you. You know, posting to your website or your social channels and just hoping that people are gonna click their way to you or find you through search, that's no longer a sufficient strategy. You have to meet audiences where they are instead of hoping that they come to you. And practically what that means is often adapting or compromising. You need to shorten your message for Twitter. You may need to revert to visuals to thrive on a platform like TikTok or Instagram. You may need to write in bullets what you just spent six months writing in a 90 page report. Um, attention spans are short. And like I said, there's competition. So you've really got to meet audiences where they already live. The second, and this is a piece that some of you may have dealt with in the past, is about earned media. And what do I mean by earned media? Can someone in the comms fields uh, define earned media? Either in the chat or just chime in. Or anyone. Is it almost like organic reach on social media, but you get it on bigger publications? Yes, yes. It's the way I tend to define earned media is it's public publicity that you've gained um, that's from content that you didn't pay for or write yourself. So you're absolutely right. A news outlet, a news article, a radio story, a broadcast hit. And for a lot of especially mid-sized and smaller NGOs and companies, you know, that was the gold standard, right? Getting a big headline or getting into the evening news. You know, what NGO doesn't want their latest research report in The Guardian, what government official didn't want to be on the evening news. And again, this might be very obvious to all of you, but traditional outlets, the high profile news outlets, you know, they produce thousands of stories a day. Um, you know, being on the front page of the New York Times might look great to a funder or your board members, but it might get buried online or on social. Uh, and oftentimes landing those big stories 
That's just the first step. The question is, how are you going to leverage that to reach more audience? And that's something we'll talk about today. The third and the last big challenge I think we confront as communicators or people who work on communications is that everything has to be digital first. Again, maybe it's obvious and maybe it's self-evident, but you know, I've worked for research organizations and think tanks that produce you know, 100 page reports. Um, we stopped just producing PDFs of those reports uh, and found ways to convey them online. You know, not everything has to be dumbed down or distilled into a tweet, um, but you know, most researchers who are reading the abstract of a policy paper or, or a research paper are probably reading it on their phones um, or even reading a blog summary of your findings. And you, that's gotta be mobile first, right? No one wants to read a PDF on their phones. Um, and before, whereas I think digital platforms were often seen from a marketing point of view as a funnel, right, a, a pathway for drawing people in to say your website or other core properties, now audiences in particular are experiencing content on a platform. So that means that they're doing something on Instagram, they're commenting, they're interacting with your content, and then they're moving on. They're not coming to your website as a result. They're not signing up for an email list. And so that means we have to quantify in a different way how we measure success. Um, so I want to stop there for some questions. I mean, I know I'm going through the big challenges right now, but I want to make sure it's clear. Am I defining enough terms, especially my comms people out there? If you have more to add here, I'd love to hear from you. Are we all clear on so far? Anyone has questions? I think that's a positive sign. Okay, good. Well, I'm curious, and you know, and you can put stuff in the chat as we go here too. You know, I'd love to hear how you think from your perspective, communications is changing, you know, either from your experience or something else. So feel free to pop ideas and thoughts into the chat and I'll raise them up um, as we go through here. Um, so I think my message though, oh yeah, please. Sorry, it was a lot of text and you speak a little bit fast and I didn't really catch uh, the main ideas from this slide. Okay, I'm happy to make sure we share this deck after the presentation uh, so we can share a PDF version afterward. But thank you. I'll make sure to go a little bit more slowly. Again, this is really just an introduction um, to start understanding what some of the big challenges are. So it's okay if you don't take away everything. Um, but I'll repeat some of the big points here. I think the first is audiences don't come to you. You need to come to them. Earned media, that is news stories and other publicity, isn't the same as it used to be. And your tactics need to be digital first, that is digital platform specific and geared toward audiences that are only going to interact with you on digital channels. And that's a good point. Uh, you know, Ali, I, I'm reading your chat here. Not sure that all digital all the time is applicable globally. Looking at the last Hungarian election could be an example, I believe. That's really interesting. Uh, Ali, if you don't mind, um, you mean uh, because so much of how the public narrative was shaped lived on television or radio? Yes, exactly. That's what I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And I think that, you know, and I think that's where the earned media pillar comes in too. Um, you know, especially if you work in politics, uh, that is a different dimension of the work. I think where I'm coming from is when we're talking about content or interactions that you're doing organically, um, you know, especially for small or mid-sized organizations, you might not have the resources or the advertising dollars to be on the radio or on television. And the question is, how do you counter those narratives, um, especially in a context like Hungary, where, you know, there's capture, there's a, a media that, that really is sort of under, under the control of a, of a particular government and point of view. But it's a great point. Yeah, and Bonnie, I'm seeing your point here too. Interacting on digital with deep content is a real challenge. Thoughts on how to bridge between digital and website that is social and website. It's a great question, Bonnie. And I, as I said, and it's something we can explore more deeply, you know, I think traditionally people have seen it as, ah, my social channels are there to market my content and market my website. And I think increasingly what's happened is that's not the case. So take a platform like Instagram. 
Instagram is a platform that doesn't necessarily drive people to the next step. They don't necessarily uh, click on a link and go to a website or click on a link and sign a petition. Um, often a lot of the interactions happen just on Instagram and then constituents move on. So I think it's changed a little bit about how we think about the kinds of content we develop for those platforms. Great, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. Um, so let me keep moving forward. But keep, yeah, keep popping to, stuff in the chat. I was going to suggest, because I feel that this is a very interactive topic, uh, that uh, keep popping questions or uh, remarks in the chat, and then we can come back to them later on so that we don't make sure that, that Stephen has time to cover it all. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. So I think my message, though, to all of you is don't panic. Even a communications department of one or none can launch and execute successful public communications campaigns. I believe it, I've done it, uh, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about what I have sort of called a new model for public communications. Um, even though it's not really new, and I think my communications colleagues here know some of this already, this is really just what I've learned in my career so far uh, what leaders in the industry have taught me, and things that I try to communicate to my colleagues uh, every time I start a new job or a new project. And again, these, these slides will be available for you all after this presentation. But I think the first thing to keep in mind is that communications is an expert field. Um, you know, there's subspecialties. There's people that specialize in specific practice areas, but it's a profession. And I think that's often a big barrier in our work. And sometimes we have to explain to leaders, especially those who control our budgets, that good communications work can sometimes come from really smart investments and leaders with experience. So, you know, think of major organizations, advocacy groups, public facing organizations that you admire, especially those that get a lot of attention. I guarantee you that they have professionalized their communications work. They understand that communications is integral to their work, uh, that it can move the needle in policy debates, in advocacy, and in legislative campaigns, among other work. And I think that brings me to my second point, which is, to me, good communications is based in thought partnership. You can hire a graphic designer. You can hire a copywriter as a consultant. But communications leaders don't want to feel like they're just a cog in a machine. They don't want to just feel like you're tasking them with an assignment. They want to be your thought partner. They want to think through strategy with you, understand your goals and objectives, and explain to you where they believe public communications work can help reach some of those goals. Um, you know, third, while our business is a profession, Costs have gone down dramatically. Uh, you know, when I was at the organization PEN America, a free expression group that's part of a global network of free expression organizations, you know, we produced a podcast, a limited run podcast five years ago, and maybe, maybe longer for those of you who have been in this business for a while, you know, podcast production was expensive. It required a lot of work and time and investments. It still does. But we actually produced our podcast with a lot of personnel time, but a lot of free resources that were available, a lot of tools to really enter uh, spaces that you might not have been able to enter before. Um, it doesn't mean everyone can be a video editor, but the costs of entry are lower. Um, and that's really important as you think about what your communication strategies look like. The fourth piece of this model, I think, is thinking about your communications through the lens of being both reactive and proactive. So what do I mean by that? Uh, let's say you're at an organization like Committee to Protect Journalists. For those who don't know, a global NGO uh, that advocates for journalist protections globally. Obviously and sadly, there are stories to respond to every single day. That organization has a fantastic rapid response protocol uh, to reach members of the press, to push content out on digital networks. But that's not 
all they spend their time on. They are also being proactive. They're advancing their own narratives, when and how they want to tell their own stories, regardless of what's happening in the world around them. To me, good models for public communications combine both how you reactive, uh, excuse me, both how you react to the world around you and how you proactively look to shape it. And finally, you know, as I said from the beginning, it's all about planning. If you manage or perform any public communications work, you got to have a plan. I have had board members and executive directors tell me, oh, we just, we just need to go viral. Uh, you just need to make a great video and it'll get out there and that accomplishes our work. Uh, the truth is, luck isn't strategy. And you shouldn't be trying to succeed based on luck. You should be succeeding based on good professional practices and great planning. So I know that's a lot. <laughs> and again, these slides will be available afterward. Uh, but let me just check in the chat. Um, you know, Rami, yes, communication is essential in our digital age today. Um, yeah, and, and Erica, I think that's a huge point here. If there's one thing you take away from this, it's very easy to spend all your time doing crisis communications and very easy to let long-term goals and strategy slip. I couldn't have said it better. You said better in one sentence what I said in many more. All right. Just advance here. So now you're thinking, okay, fine, Stephen. You've given us all these principles, these ideas, these concepts. How do I actually do it? <laughs> How do I actually put any of this into practice? And I think a lot of you, and again, if you're in communications, or even if you're not, um, you might have been asked to write a communications plan. Maybe just a quick show of hands, a thumbs up. Have you ever been asked to write a communications plan? I see a few. I see a few. I see some hands. I see some, some hands raised. Pop it in the chat. Uh, another thumbs up from Ali. Absolutely. Um, I have been asked to write probably hundreds of communications plans in my career. And I don't like them. <laughs> I'm not saying that you shouldn't be planning, but I've seen people spend so much time on a communications plan, a long written document that they've spent hours or days on that often is very lofty or ambitious or has really big goals, but sometimes misses reality, the nitty gritty of getting the work done and does it without clear timelines in mind. You know, we work, especially for those of you in the NGO sector, especially small and mid-sized NGOs, everything changes every day, right? You got a planning meeting to go to, you got to give a speech tomorrow, you have a funder application to submit. Your communications planning has to work in reality and it has to work in a time frame that makes sense. Um, and sometimes there just isn't time. Sometimes you just need to put some bullets together in an email, scribble it on your notepad. But to me, I think rather than focusing on a single plan or a single moment in time, I like to think of strategy planning as a that's where you're writing the plan. Maybe that's the long document. Excuse me? It's Sorry, a you, you, you got a bit stuck for me. I wasn't sure if it was for everyone else. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. I will, I will go back just a couple of seconds here. Just to say, rather than thinking about writing a big strategy plan, I think about strategy as a timeline. So on this timeline, you'll see that the second stage is called brief. This is where I think you do some of that writing, some of that communications plan work, but I see it as part of a continuum of work. So let me walk you through about this timeline and see if there's any questions. So let's start at the very beginning, which is the kickoff, uh, or what I'll call the kickoff meeting. And I, I think whether it's virtual or in person, this is where you gather all of your stakeholders. This could be the people who are making final decisions, who are setting budgets. These are the people with the big ideas and your communications team, whether that's a team of one or none, uh, anyone who's got responsibility for communications of a particular project. 
And the core idea of a kickoff meeting is to identify some of the project goals, audiences, and strategies, the things that we laid out earlier in this conversation. It's meant to be a dialogue to understand what those priorities look like. Um, you know, someone in that meeting, I guarantee you, is going to say, well, wait a minute, how many blogs do we need to write? How many press releases do we need to send? This is not the time for that conversation. This is meant to be very high level and objective driven. This is brainstorming. This is big thinking. And this could be a phone call. This could be 30 minutes. But if you make time for that conversation, that's less about the tactics and more about the strategy, the higher level pieces, the next pieces start to flow together. Because that, after that meeting, usually what I do, what our communications colleagues here might do, is we start to do a little bit of the plan writing, right? Um, I call this the brief uh, or strategy brief. And this is where your comms team or whoever is assigned to lead the project, they map it all out. They memorialize the conversation so that folks remember what we agreed to. They outline the goals and strategies and audiences that were agreed to in the kickoff. And then they start to outline deliverables, timelines, budgets, uh, blog posts, videos, social media collateral, um, their budget. How much is this going to cost in time, in resource, and risks? What are the risks to this strategy? Who are our competitors? How are we going to make sure that our message is getting out to the public? Uh, truly, no project is without risk. And this is where you will spend a lot of time, but it is the place where sometimes you get caught up in the long strategy memo. I've done this stage in an email with bullet points because we had to launch a product the next day. But again, getting this stuff in writing, memorializing those conversations so people remember them, I think is, is mission critical. The next stage is then you get to develop. This is the fun part. This is where we build the artwork. We're in Photoshop, we're in Canva. We write the blogs, we write the press releases, we develop the flyers or the one sheets. This is the doing part of the process, and it's where delegation is essential, especially if you don't have a dedicated communications team. Whoever the project leader is, is going to have to make some assignments. Who's going to write the thing? Who's going to create the artwork? Do you have a budget to hire someone to help? And if you don't, is it realistic to execute against all of the deliverables you've outlined? This is a very iterative process where you're going back to the brief while you're developing materials. The fourth stage here, and this might not be essential for everyone, but because I, I'm a journalist and I come from this background, um, I call this the pitch phase. And this is where you leave yourself sufficient time to communicate to the press, to media, and to journalists. All too often, I've been asked for planning a project with just a few weeks or even a few days, and sometimes that is unavoidable. But if you want to leverage media, if you want to get that earned media, Ali, I'm thinking in the Hungary context, you want to make sure journalists know your message. You need to start communicating with them about your project or your idea early. And you have to leave yourself time for that strategy to fail. You might want to advance a story to a reporter and say, you know what, I'm just giving this to you. This is an exclusive. No one else gets it. But journalists are busy. They might not get back to you for a few hours or a few days or maybe even a week. And if you don't build yourself enough runway, enough time at this stage, you're gonna run out of it. You're not gonna have enough time to go to more journalists or more reporters or even influencers. It's not just about journalists. This could be you know, someone famous in your field, someone who could be a great message amplifier or your coalition partners. You need to make time for that work. Otherwise, you're not gonna have sufficient time at the end as you review and launch your project. And then I'll quickly cover these last two sections, but I want to open it up here. Um, you know, I think the next stage, of course, is review. This is where you go through, make sure the report is copy edited, make sure that the blogs aren't incorrect, make sure everyone loves the artwork, making sure that you're really living up to a high quality communications product. And then there's launch. 
And if you've left enough time for all of these phases, this is where you can be very coordinated. You can time the rollout of your messaging. You can time the deployment of your social media posts. Maybe you've got a partner organization to agree to spread your message and they're all gonna do it at the same time of day that afternoon. You can take a deep breath at this stage, but it's also where you as a communications professional or someone project managing a communications project, this is when you're also starting to monitor and observe. You're going back, have we achieved what we thought we would? And if not, why not? How can we better prepare for the next project? It's iterative, it's learning, you never get it all right, but I think it's the most exciting part is to really understand what you've done and what you've launched. So I wanna move into some case studies because this is all very theoretical, but I wanna open it up for any questions or comments. Yeah, um, I had a question on the back here about what are often referred to as KPIs. Does anyone know what KPI stands for? Key performance indicators. Key performance, thank you, Eric and Nelson. Key performance indicators, right? These are the ways that you're measuring success. And these are things that often get established in that brief process, in the planning stage. How are we gonna measure here? And sometimes it's very concrete, right? I mean, if you work in the private sector and you work in marketing, sometimes your KPIs are very clear. Uh, you know, you need to sell a certain amount of magazines. You need to push your product in front of a certain number of people. Um, you wanna establish those things early on. Uh, and I think sometimes they are quantifiable and sometimes they're not. Um, sometimes it's one thing, it's uh, getting a major editorial board to uh, endorse your position or a, a newspaper to cover what you've done. But I think it's really important to set those benchmarks up from the beginning, because it's very easy mid midway through a project to suddenly a, a leader comes to you, an executive director or CEO and says, well, what about this? Did we think about, did we think about uh, getting this message onto radio advertising uh, next week? And suddenly you're left to scramble. And that's always gonna happen, right? <laughs> Leaders are always gonna throw you for a loop. But being able to come back to those core KPIs, those key performance indicators is really helpful in your project. We do love them, yes. Cool. Other questions or ideas or cha please challenge me on any of this. This is my approach. Other people disagree with it. Feel free to raise your hand or speak up. Yeah, interrupt me, please. I talk too much and too fast. But also very passionate about it. I care. I care a lot about this work. I love this work. All right. Well, let's maybe if we move into some case studies, I can show you a little bit of how we put some of this stuff into practice. And then I really want you to probe here. I want you to ask questions about what we did or what we didn't do, what mistakes we made. Um, otherwise, I'm going to start calling on people. That's going to happen. All right. So let's advance to some case studies. So here's a project that I worked on when I was at PEN America. And again, PEN America, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation, uh, is a free expression and literary organization. And it's part of a global network of PEN centers. So I don't know where everyone is here, but there's a PEN UK, PEN Ukraine, PEN Myanmar. Uh, there are PEN centers around the world. Um, and in recent years, our US chapter had built a profile around fighting disinformation. Um, and you know, you might think, well, why would a group of writers care about disinformation? Well, you know, I think it's actually pretty self-evident. It's a threat to the free exchange of ideas. Uh, you know, when the information well is poisoned by information that is meant to deceive or mislead, uh, that hurts our public discourse. It hurts our ability to test out ideas and talk to one another. So as some of you may know, in 2020, the United States had a presidential election. Uh, and as we approached uh, that presidential election, we knew that disinformation and misinformation were going to influence voters and the public. But the question was, how could PEN America respond, right? Not a, not a small organization, I would say a mid-sized NGO with a good budget and a full communications team. 
But still, we had to ask a lot of questions. There were a lot of people in this field, a lot of other organizations, a lot of people trying to do something similar. So with help from a funder, so we did have financial resources, we were asked to launch a public facing campaign to help combat disinformation. That was it, combat disinformation, huge objective, right? And I am always a fan of big lofty goals, but our first reaction was, wait, how can we do this in a realistic way? How can we understand which audiences we could actually reach and what could we achieve with those audiences in a reasonable way? And again, the funder didn't say you have to reach every voting age person in the United States. They just said, public facing, combat disinformation, go. So I think this is where that kickoff stage, that big think, that, that moment to test drive lots of different ideas, this is where it really came into play. And if we return to that first slide, those three principles, our biggest first question was, what is the audience that we can tap into for a campaign like this? So we start with our own audience. What do we already know about the people that we reach on social media, through our emails, and through our events? And we already had a pretty good idea of what that audience looked like. They were progressive politically. Um, they tended to be in urban areas, city dwelling. Uh, they were already attuned to the news and the issues of civil liberties. So they were allies already. These aren't people that we needed to win over or convince. These were people who were in alignment with our mission, our goals, and ideas. But we also had some interesting data that was not our own data, but that we had reviewed that showed that even people with a lot of information, smart, progressive, civically minded people were very susceptible to misinformation and needed help, especially with fact checking on their own. So that started to then identify, okay, well, we're not trying to reach everyone. Remember I said from the beginning, your audience is never everyone. We started thinking, okay, here's this very specific audience city dwelling, high educated, people who already care passionately about these issues. But again, from the public information, we knew that they might be susceptible to mis or disinformation and they might see it in their own networks and are looking to combat it, but don't know how. So this started to give some clarity around who we were gonna reach, right? And then I think the question was, what do we know works with this audience? What have we already done in the past, right? We don't have to start from scratch. What do we know about our audience that fits this mold about what they're looking for, right? I, earlier in this presentation, I talked about meeting your audiences halfway. So what are the things that we know they're already interested in? So one of the things that we looked at from our data from the backside of our website was what kinds of blogs and tip sheets were performing well? And one of our highest performers by far was a tip sheet on how to talk to friends and family who were sharing disinformation. This thing was like, we were getting tens of thousands of hits. It was getting organic shares. You know, we were seeing it ripple across social media. So we thought, aha, this is an audience that cares about this and is seeing it in their digital ecosystem and doesn't know what to do. And here was a resource that was made to help them. So that started to give us some ideas about tactics. That is, okay, we've got this higher level ambition of combating disinformation. We then have this lower tier goal of, okay, how can we equip audiences that look like ours with the tools they need to fight back? And tactically, what are the things they're looking for? What are the things that they like? What are the things that they find attractive in terms of digital content? So we decided to build our campaign based, based around this awareness raising component, uh, advancing our fact checking tools and strategies to our core audiences and audiences that resembled them. But then the question, of course, and this gets back to the point that Erica raised about KPIs, how are we going to measure success? How are we going to know that this actually helped combat disinformation? And, and I think this is the hardest part for people in public communications. Sometimes there's a little bit of a leap of faith. We might not know 100% that X number of dollars spent on an advertising campaign changed this many minds, a million minds, 100,000 minds. But we can look at different data to understand 
did our message at least get across and did people understand it? So not only were we looking at things like page views, on social media, we were looking at impressions. That's the number of people that saw our content. Engagements, that's the number of people who liked or shared or commented on our content. But we also thought, could we develop something sort of fun and public facing that would measure whether or not our message was breaking through? So we built a quiz. We built a quiz that we marketed to our constituents. They would take the quiz and check their own knowledge, and then they could share it with friends. So we figured that was a lot of different ways to think about what success could look like. Now, already I can tell you, the quiz was not a huge success. Um, we built a, a paid advertising campaign around it, didn't quite take off. We had some technical glitches. It was, it was not the perfect thing that we wanted it to be. But there were other components that did succeed. We built a lot of video content uh, that we measured engagements on. And again, like I said before, these tools for measuring are cheaper and more accessible. On YouTube, with a free account, you can see how long people are watching your videos. Again, you can see what engagement rates look like and see how these pieces of content are performing. So we were really proud of this campaign. It was imperfect. Uh, we had to throw it together really fast. As you can see, it was highly visual. Um, so this campaign really thrived on a platform like Instagram, where visual first campaigns tend to thrive. And we came out of it with, I think, a really clear sense of our success metrics and reported that back to our funder and also felt like we had made um, some real change here. So I'm happy to answer some questions about this campaign or about any of the things that I've said so far. Otherwise, I'm going to start asking questions. How about qualitative measures? So not just quantitative, but qualitative measure? Such a good question. One of the things that we did, so the question again was qualitative, not just quantitative measures. One of the things that we thought was really important in this campaign was working with journalists. And again, this was a secondary strategy. You know, we weren't trying to influence or change journalists' minds. But we did want to hear from journalists about how they were viewing disinformation and convening, especially journalists who didn't have major fact checking resources to understand the resources that were available to them. So in that sense, one of our quantitative metrics was uh, we ran a number of workshops and the question was how many people attended the workshop, right? A quantitative metric. But qualitatively, we also debriefed with a lot of these journalists and editors. We talked to them about, hey, this hit the right mark. Do you feel like these strategies are successful? Do you think that there's more we could be doing here? And so we heard back from constituents who were part of the campaign, and that was really meaningful for us. Similarly, you know, we would hear back from our, our influencers. So as part of this campaign, we tapped you know, literary celebrities and other writers because we wanted to showcase our brand voice where we often would work with writers and artistic figures. And when they would tell us something resonated, again, it's hard to know if it was resonating with their audiences or not, but it was helpful for us to hear back and get feedback from them about what they thought was successful and how they felt they could deploy some of these tools and strategies. So absolutely that your KPIs are not gonna always be quantitative. You're not always gonna be able to measure everything, but that doesn't mean you can't still set up some benchmarks for yourself focus groups, reactions, comments. We got a lot of um, you know, DMs and Facebook messages about the performance of our campaign and we took those seriously. I'm wondering if, um, if anyone else has a, a public facing campaign or communications initiative that, that they've launched and, and whether any of this resonates or whether you took a different approach. I'm looking to my comms colleagues here on this call, putting you on the spot. Seems like we have shy people here. I doubt it. Well, even if you have a link or something you wanna share in the chat, I'd love to see other projects that folks have worked on. And again, other questions too. Um, I'm happy to move on to a second case study if that's useful. Great. So this is a slightly older campaign that I was not involved in from the beginning, um, but one that I think was a very successful one and, and perhaps very resonant um, with what's happening uh, in, in Ukraine in particular today. 
Uh, I ran uh, publicity for an organization called Physicians for Human Rights uh, for many years. And that organization was a group of healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, public health officials, who cared very passionately about human rights issues. And we conducted human rights investigations. Um, the most famous investigation that we had been part of had been uh, after the Balkan Wars and the exhumation of graves at Srebrenica. Uh, we had also been involved in some of the uh, forensic work uh, in, uh, in Rwanda and elsewhere around the world. So the organization had a, a really high profile record of tracking war crimes in particular. And as many of you are well aware, uh, when the civil war began in Syria, uh, there was a concerted campaign by the government of Syria and its air force, as well as some of its allies to target hospitals and healthcare workers. Now, for years, PHR had been relying on open source information. That is information collected from publicly available records photographs, videos, and other documentation to start creating a documentary record of what was happening on the ground in Syria, what was happening to health professionals. And I should also say, by the way, other parties to this conflict were also targeting healthcare professionals, which for those of you in the international law arena know is a war crime to intentionally inflict uh, harm on health professionals or health facilities. The problem that we faced though, was that we had this data the question was, if we were going to try to prove to international investigators, to United Nations officials and diplomats, that this was indeed a war crime, that there was a pattern, that these were intentional attacks, we had to somehow show that pattern. So again, this was a good example of a very narrow audience. We were talking about you know, diplomats, the people who influence them, right? The, the, Per, the journalists that they read, the columnists that they talk to, the officials who surround them. Um, again, our audience was not everyone. Our audience was people very much plugged into the contours of this conflict. And then the second question was, what are we trying to achieve with them? We're trying to explain and showcase that our data demonstrates that there was a pattern of war crimes being conducted. And so, Tactically, we decided that rather than write reports, uh, which we did, we did write some reports, um, or, or do uh, a big investigational report that we would then deliver to United Nations officials, we developed a map. We worked with other open source um, researchers. We worked with technology companies. Again, this is where technology costs have come down so much for this kind of work. And we started to create an interactive database of all of these attacks. Every time we knew about an attack on a healthcare worker, an ambulance, a hospital, a medical clinic, we started putting it on a map. And, and part of that seems very simple, right? I mean, everyone thinks of a map, right? But the question started to become, how could we demonstrate that this was a pattern? And so we started to show that a lot of these attacks were concentrated in areas where there were offenses going on where the Air Force was trying to quash a certain uh, uh, insurgency in a certain location. We also documented what are called double tap strikes. That's when, say, a hospital or health facility is hit, emergency workers come in, and then it's struck again. A particularly odious war crime, and one that we felt very strongly we needed to showcase and document. And so part of our initiative here from a public communications side was we're not just trying to tally what's happening. We're not trying to, to count the number of times. We're trying to demonstrate pattern. And so that way, and again, this gets back to this idea of proactive versus reactive. So we were obviously reacting to situations on the ground, but then we were proactively pushing our message, these constitute a war crime. So we would sit down with reporters like Somani Sengupta at the New York Times, who at the time was the United Nations Bureau Chief. We said, look, it's not just about one attack. It's about a pattern of attacks. Let me show you. We opened up our map. We had our collateral. We had a beautiful brochures and leave behinds that illustrated all of this for folks. Um, and we did have a more public aggressive campaign. We had petitions that we would send to folks. And oftentimes those wouldn't necessarily convince a diplomat at the United Nations, but would help gather allies, 
people, we could go into a room and say, it's not, we're not just speaking for ourselves, we're speaking for tens of thousands of people who agree with us. Now, there's a lot of political contours to this example. I realize a lot of, a lot of very tragic pieces to this campaign, but in a lot of ways, it was about narrative shift. And I think this gets to the question of qualitative versus quantitative. Um, this was very hard to measure success in this campaign, right? I mean, you know, tragically that conflict continues even today as the world has shifted attentions. And of course, we're looking at very similar patterns happening in Ukraine right now. But where we really saw performance and where we really saw, you know, maybe a silver lining to a very sad situation was we felt like we had influenced the narrative around the conversation. People had started to refer to what was happening as war crimes or a pattern of war crimes. They were citing our data, not just in the sixth or seventh paragraph of a story, but in the first paragraph of the story. You'll see my colleague, Susanna Serkin was on BBC nearly every other week during the height of attacks to make sure that our narrative was getting pushed out there. Do we know if we changed millions of minds? I don't, I don't know that. But what I do know is that we had a clear influence on the narratives that were being portrayed about that conflict. And that was a qualitative check on what we thought of as our success in this campaign in particular. So let me stop there and open for more questions. Oh, did I mute myself? Sorry. <laughs> I'm actually gonna take down the screen share so I can see folks. Is that all right? Go ahead. Okay. If I can figure it out, hold on. Uh-oh. <laughs> there we go. Can everyone see me and hear me again? Yep. Great. Questions, ideas, topics. What are you all working on that intersects? Erica, please. I, I have a, a, a question that I, I'd love to ask you and kind of open up to the group um, that relates somewhat to um, your, your example of the mapping in the Syria. Um, you know, one thing that I worry about that we deal with at BARD um, somewhat regularly is how to engage with a global moment in a way that is um, authentic without seeming opportunistic. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of activism that happens on campus, let's say around uh, protesting the war in Ukraine and, you know, raising funds for support. Um, you know, we had uh, a number of F students from Afghanistan transferred to BARD during, during this most recent conflict, um, as, I, as I think a lot of folks here from different institutions did. Um, how do we talk about things like that in a way that is... Um, not opportunistic and not self-aggrandizing, um, but really focuses on what's going on and uh, ha has a, a motion toward the kind of change that you've just described rather than just trying to kind of glom onto a moment. Yeah, well, I think you, you, you sort of in, in your question sort of I think highlighted two things to consider. And again, I, I don't have a perfect answer and I'd love to hear from others, but I'll just say briefly, I think the first is that it's in the service of some greater goal. Um, you know, I think to me, and, and this is often what we refer to as pulling back the curtain, um, you're not just telling the story for the story's sake. You're not asking a student to share a narrative or, you know, sharing something on your social channels or on your website just to do it, um, but that you really believe that there's a call to action, that there's awareness raising, that there's some outcome that can happen as a result of that work. And look, everything comes at a cost. I mean, I, again, came out of the human rights world where, there was always, there was always a, a sinister feeling of, well, we're documenting this, we're showcasing it. These are lives, um, individuals with agency. Um, you know, uh, human rights organizations, especially in North America, have a terrible track record of using grisly photographs and, and horrendous outcomes to raise money. Um, and that can feel very transactional and, and very, very uh, unethical. And so I think, you know, being guided by that, being guided by what your what your purpose is, is really important. And then I do think it is about um, being very clear about what your objectives are with people that you're working with. You know, if it's for a fundraising initiative, it's for an advocacy initiative. People need to go in clear eyed. You know, again, I came out of the, the health with working with health professionals. You often hear about informed consent, uh, and I think that's vital in the in the communications work that we do. I'm seeing some folks chiming in here in the chat. Does anyone else have, have comments on that particular uh, topic or question? I don't have a great answer, probably. 
I agree with you that as long as it has some greater purpose at the back, that could in, that could diminish the feeling of transactional or forced uh, effort to hijack the momentum. Yeah, yeah. By the way, Iman, I love your example here about meeting your audiences where they are. Everyone, take a look in the chat there. Do you want to do you want to just say this out loud? Um, sure. So I come from Cameroon, and we have a coffee shop where we, our target audience is basically local farmers because uh, we've noticed that um, we tend to export our product. So we want farmers to gain uh, more benefit from their expenses. And so our coffee shop, we took the initiative to partner with a bus company. So we placed QR codes on the back of each seat and followed by an ad. And so each passenger would scan the code and it would bring them to like a sort of a spinning wheel. They would spin the wheel at maximum two times and win prizes, which will um, then be retrieved at the coffee shop. So have this element of making them come to us by going to them, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's so instructive because, you know, I think a lot of us, like I, again, mostly coming from the advocacy and human rights arena. Yes, I also want to copy now too. Um, you know, we don't think like that. We don't think about the QR code and the incentive and the two-way street. What is someone getting out of this transaction? You know, I think a big mistake that NGOs and advocacy groups make is they try to throw information at people and just hope that they read it and respond. And, you know, again, with a QR code, right? And I imagine you could measure how many people uh, were interacting with it. Obviously anyone who claimed a prize or claimed a coupon code, you could measure how successful that campaign was. I'm not saying that every advocacy campaign has to mirror a private sector one and vice versa, but I do think there's a lot of learning that can happen there and a lot of good principles from examples like that that I think are, 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 are applicable across the sector. Well, I know we're, we're at an hour um, and maybe folks are exhausted uh, or tired of hearing me talk, which is okay. Um, but again, I'm happy to also just answer general questions about communications, about the field, um, hear ideas that you all have. Also happy to wrap up and make sure that you all have this PowerPoint presentation uh, delivered to you and my email address if you have questions. But yeah, please let's consider the floor open. Yeah, I actually have a question, if I may start. Please. Uh, so I was thinking, what would you recommend to be the main skills uh, to be acquired if someone is looking forward uh, for a professional career in communication? Writing. Uh, and I'm talking about in communication, I'm talking about uh, BR, campaign management, so I'm talking about... Uh, yeah, like more higher ranking communications than the um, the like artist uh, communication. Right? Yeah, uh, writing. I would say writing. I mean, so often I think in our field. Uh, hi, Doki. Uh, so often in our field, uh, you know, we we have to produce copy. We have to produce text, one-liners, tweets, blogs, press releases. It is so much writing. And to me, the, the more you do it and the more somebody tears it up, right? Always have somebody read your work. Um, you know, you, you get so much better at it. You don't have to sit through a course. You don't have to, you know, uh, rely on somebody to teach you how to do it. You just have to do it a lot. And you have to not be, I think, um, I use this term a lot and forgive me, it's a little bit of an idiom, but uh, you can't be precious about your writing. 